Welcome to the fourth and final session in our series looking at the 39 Articles of the Church of England. These can be watched in conjunction with the Catechism Service video, or they can be watched on their own. Links to all the videos and also to those on the Catechism of the Church of England and also the Book of Common Prayer can be found in the description below this video. So we start our fourth session on the 39 Articles with a reading from 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 11 to 16. Here is a trustworthy saying, If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarrelling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. In the first session we looked at the place of the Articles of Religion as one of the historic formularies or foundational documents of the Church of England which contained the doctrine of the Church of England. We looked at the first eight articles which states that the Church of England affirms the universal Catholic and Apostolic faith and holds that it is the Bible alone which determines what that faith is. Then we looked at articles 9 to 18 under the heading Personal Religion or man and his salvation, seeing how we are justified by faith in Jesus alone. And in the last session, entitled Corporate Religion, we explored ideas about the church, its ministry and the sacraments. In this final session, we look at the remaining eight articles which address various topics. As was said in our first session, the articles are not necessarily arranged in a systematic way and so the divisions we've used are to some extent arbitrary. As we look at the last articles, we'll see that most of them could fit in the previous session on the church, its ministry and its sacraments. One reason for splitting them off, as we are doing, is for the distinction made in Article 20. The church hath power to decree rites or ceremonies and authority in controversies of faith. The articles we looked at last time fall generally into the category of controversies of faith or doctrinal matters. And this week's looks at rites and ceremonies, which, as we'll see in Article 34, may change, unlike doctrine. However, this distinction doesn't bear too close an examination when it comes to the content of each article, or even each group. So the first two articles we're looking at this session, Article 32 of marriage of priests. Priests, bishops and deacons are not commanded by God's law either to vow the estate of single life or to abstain from marriage. Therefore it is lawful for them, as for all other Christian men, to marry at their own discretion, as they shall judge the same to serve better to godliness. And Article 36 of Consecration of Bishops and Ministers the Book of Consecration of Archbishops and Bishops and Ordering of Priests and Deacons doth contain all things necessary to such consecration and ordering. Neither hath it anything that of itself is superstitious and ungodly. We start with Article 32, which I paired with Article 36 on a similar topic. Article 23 says that those who preach the word and administer the sacraments should be lawfully chosen, called and sent. And Article 36 says that the book of the consecration of archbishops and bishops and ordering of priests and deacons, called the ordinal for short, is a lawful way of doing this. The ordinal, although originally separate, is now found together with the Book of Common Prayer. These two articles are another example of where the Church of England distinguished itself from both the Roman Catholic Church and from other Protestant groups. They assert the three orders of ministry, bishops, priests and deacons, unlike some Protestants who abolished bishops and some who abolished all three orders. 
It also defended the ceremonies in the ordination services, such as the laying on of hands by the bishop, which some reformers thought was, was a superstitious act of passing on magical power from bishop to minister, or an ungodly act where the bishop usurped God's role of anointing ministers. The ordinal changed the way ministers in England were ordained compared to the pre-Reformation Roman Catholic ceremonies, so Article 36 argues that they are still validly ordained. This argument may seem archaic, but the official position of the Roman Catholic Church was set out in 1896 by Pope Leo XIII, who, in his papal bull Apostolicae Curae, declared Anglican orders to be absolutely null and utterly void, therefore meaning that we are not a fully Christian church, but merely an ecclesial community. One reason given for this is that there is a defect of intention. Roman Catholic priests are given a chalice and pattern at their ordination because their authority first and foremost is to offer the sacrifice of the Mass. This theology of what happens in the communion service has already been rejected by the Articles. So, according to the Ordinal, Anglican priests are given a Bible because their authority is first and foremost to preach the Word of God. The Ordinal doesn't intend to ordain sacrificing priests, therefore, according to the Roman Catholic Church, its orders are invalid. The issue of the marriage of priests in Article 32 again seems to be an archaic one, and even in the Roman Catholic Church you will now find married clergy, most of whom were at one time Church of England ministers. However, this article has found a contemporary controversy, because the phrase Therefore it is lawful for them, as for all other Christian men, to marry at their own discretion, is being used to argue that clergy should be able to enter into same-sex marriages. The argument goes that as it is lawful for people to marry someone of their own sex, it is lawful for clergy to do so too. However, this interpretation is not consistent with the rest of the article. Firstly, the law is not the law of the land, but God's law which the Church declares, echoing Jesus' teaching in the marriage service, by saying that marriage is a gift of God in creation, through which husband and wife may know the grace of God. Secondly, the discretion is not a blanket permission for clergy to do whatever they want, but it is how they shall judge the same to serve better to godliness. The House of Bishops uh, in a report in December 2019 said that sexual relationships outside heterosexual marriage are regarded as falling short of God's purposes for human beings. A clergy person cannot by definition serve better to godliness by entering into a same-sex marriage. Article 33 of excommunicate persons how they are to be avoided. That person which, by open denunciation of the church, is rightly cut off from the unity of the church and excommunicated, ought to be taken of the whole multitude of the faithful, as an heathen and publican, until he be openly reconciled by penance, and received into the church by a judge that hath authority thereunto. Article 33 sounds very odd to us, particularly as excommunication is not really done today. However, this article reminds us that discipline should be part of the life of the Church. Article 26 said that even though the effectiveness of the sacraments is not diminished by wicked ministers, nevertheless the Church has a duty to investigate and discipline unfaithful ministers. Article 33 reminds us that the purpose of this discipline is to encourage repentance and reconciliation. Article 36 of the Traditions of the Church it is not necessary that the traditions and ceremonies be in all places one and utterly like, for at all times they have been diverse and may be changed according to the diversities of countries, times and men's manners, so that nothing be ordained against God's word. Every particular or national church hath authority to ordain, change and abolish ceremonies or rites of the church ordained only by man's authority, so that all things be done to edifying. The Church of England states in the creeds that the Church is one, 
But it also argued in Article 34 that that didn't mean that the church had to be utterly alike at all times and in all places. Diversity of traditions and ceremonies was acceptable as long as it didn't go against God's word. This promotion of diversity seems at odds with the simultaneous act of uniformity, which said that the Book of Common Prayer was the only legal form of worship. Both positions could be held because the article argues that each particular church could decide its own ceremonies, and the most obvious division of particular churches was the nation under the authority of the monarch, which topic we'll come back to in a moment. This article meant that as the British Empire expanded and the clergy went to evangelise and also to look after the spiritual needs of the colonials, they were free to adapt their forms of worship to their new context, as long, of course, as what they ordered wasn't against the Bible. Article 35 of the Homilies. The second book of Homilies doth contain a godly and wholesome doctrine and necessary for these times, as doth the former book of homilies, and therefore we judge them to be read in churches by ministers diligently and distinctly, that they may be understanded of the people. Article 35 commends the second book of homilies from 1571, as well as the first book from 1547, as godly and wholesome doctrine. These books of homilies were necessary not just to explain what the Reformation had rediscovered in terms of Christian belief, but also because at the time of the Reformation the standard of education amongst the clergy was very low and preaching was either of poor quality or non-existent. The church had frequently been characterised as a good career opportunity for the family idiot. The homilies were therefore designed also to ensure a good standard of preaching and they cover a wide range of topics including doctrine, ethics, worship and politics. However, we should bear in mind that some of them were written with their own in situations in mind, particularly the political sermons. They are, as Article 35 says, necessary for these times. So we do not have to take everything they say as being the teaching of the Church of England, particularly ones on political topics. This does not apply, though, to the doctrinal homilies, which, as they are consistent with the Bible's teaching, are to be taken as official church doctrine. Article 37 of the Civil Magistrates The King's Majesty hath the chief power in this realm of England and other his dominions, unto whom the chief government of all the states of this realm, whether they be ecclesiastical or civil, in all causes doth appertain, and is not, nor ought to be, subject to any foreign jurisdiction. We give not to our princes the ministering either of God's word or of the sacraments. And the Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in this realm of England. Article 37 takes us into the political realm and reminds us of one of the central disputes in the English Reformation, who is in charge. This article states clearly that the monarch has been given chief power and control by God of all the states, whether they be ecclesiastical or civil, and thus the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, has no jurisdiction here. The effect of this article is that the interests of the nation could no longer be played off against the interests of the Church, as the monarch was the chief power of both. This had been the situation in earlier English history, for example Thomas Becket, resisting Henry II's attempts to enable clergy to be tried in civil courts rather than ecclesiastical courts. However, although the monarch is the supreme governor of the Church of England, the article also states that they are not to minister God's word or sacraments. Therefore, they are not to have any role in internal church affairs and are themselves subject to the law of God as found in his word. The preface to the articles says that the role of defender of faith and supreme governor is to conserve and maintain the church committed to our charge in unity of true religion and in the bond of peace. The final two articles. Article 38 of Christian men's goods which are not common and Article 39 of a Christian man's oath. The final two articles touch on matters which were disputed by other Protestant groups. 
Article 38 says that it is lawful for Christians to own property, although they should give alms to the poor liberally. And Article 39 says that Christians are allowed to swear oaths in court. So there we have them, the 39 Articles, which contain the true doctrine of the Church of England, agreeable to God's word. So some questions for reflection. Firstly, are the articles a help or a hindrance in ecumenical discussions? Question two, what are the pros and cons of unity and diversity in forms of worship? And three, what relationship should the church try to have with the state?